I think those are two different questions for me. How I got into music, um, I have, I'm the youngest of four kids, and uh, my oldest sister, who's the oldest in the family, was was kind of an audiophile. She was, she had a, uh, like a really great uh, sound system. She had a techniques system with a turntable, and you know, it was, it was like, like high-end stereo equipment. Just listening to, to music, on a regular basis, it was a it was a big part of what I did when I was young. And you have to understand that this was this was like pre videos, pre MTV, pre everything really. And and so when you listen to music at that time, you had to you had to listen to music, and that's all you did. You know, nowadays you can listen to music on your phone. You can listen to music doing other things. But picture like the big headphones, right? and the curly Q quarter inch jack that's six feet long. And so you had to plug in and you couldn't be more than six feet away from the, right? The sound system. And, and then you had the, the LPs that you could, you basically got lost in that world of music. And it was fascinating for me. As far as percussion goes, uh, this is a, a strange story. This is, uh, I had a best friend that was the drummer for the stage band like the jazz band in sixth grade. And uh, I knew not, there was no music besides my sister, really. Um, and and so one day he, he had like a, a doctor's appointment or something where he couldn't be at rehearsal and I was his best friend. And he just said, he just literally looks at me and goes, hey, can you sit in for me for the jazz band? And I'm like, he goes, yeah, it's easy. All you have to do is this. And he showed me like a basic uh, like groove, a basic backbeat thing with the drum set. And, uh, you know, I sat into the rehearsal and I could do it and I could do it right away. And that to me was the most encouraging thing ever. You know, just like the, the fact that I could do it right away was just inspiring to me. And that from that point on, I remember, um, like right after that, during the Christmas holiday, I took the drum set home with me. Uh, I, it's funny, I, could, I remember putting in my upstairs bedroom and my, like I started playing for like, like two minutes and my father completely <laughs> went upstairs and said, this is not going to work. So we took um, the drum set down into the basement. It was more or less like an unfinished basement. And then I set my drum set up there and um, just practiced in, an insane amount. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of an obsessive compulsive person and it was... Um, just the start of years long uh, practicing playing drum set. Nothing but drum set. Nothing but uh, playing drum set by rote and, and, and listening to music and trying to translate it to drum set. Like I had a, uh, a huge collection of records and I just listened to drum set players and then I would go downstairs and, and try to emulate what I had heard, you know. The first album I ever got was uh, The Song Remains the Same by Led Zeppelin. And then I got all the Steely Dan records, which were like an education in themselves. You know, just different drummers on the same album was a new thing. And, um, you know, I, I just, uh, my parents were the greatest. I could play for hours down in that basement and they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, deter me at all. They wouldn't stop me. I would come home from school at 3 p.m. and I would just go down and immediately I would go down and start playing and then it wouldn't be until like um, you know six o'clock or so that my mom would flick on the lights to tell me to stop and I would come up and play and after dinner I would go back down and at 9 p.m. she would click on the lights again and so imagine the parents <laughs> seriously like a kid practicing drum set for like six hours a day and and I would just uh, I just really got lost in that world. I loved it. It was an immediate thing for me. I just thought it was, it was, uh, I can hardly remember a time where I didn't play, you know, honestly. Uh, yeah, this is, it's funny because all these stories are, are, are kind of uh, unique. And I went to graduate school with Eric Johnson. The, like seriously, I went to graduate school with Eric Johnson and he wrapped a pair of mallets for one of my recitals. And he was, this was then the, in the time where he didn't live in Nashville at all. He lived, he lived at school with the rest of us. And, uh, he was just, he was, um, 
would could just rap mallets. And he was kind of one of the first people I ever met that could rap mallets. I met a couple people that have had tried it and it kind of like showed me how to sew mallets, but it was it was really rare. I mean, it was one of those things where everybody that the limit of the choice of mallets was extremely small. I mean, you 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 everyone pretty much played with the same stuff. Well, Eric had that vision of 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 making the mallet to fit what you wanted instead of just the other way around. Instead of trying to play in a way that made this mallet sound good with this piece, it was the other way around. It was like the choice of that mallet. And I remember, uh, you know, you're really becoming good friends with him in college and understanding that and thinking, oh wow, you know, and I was playing a, you know, I was playing a, a box sonata and it had a real pretty, pretty uh, andante to it and it was, you know, and I just was, and he goes, hey, I think I have some, you know, something for you. And he wrapped a pair of, uh, I still have them to this day, a pair of powder blue mallets that just perfect, absolutely perfect. They just made playing that piece so much easier. And so, and, and uh, yeah, I cherish those mallets. I really do because they were just handmade. And, uh, you know, I used them for a recital and they were perfect. And, uh, so then Eric left school and we we stayed loosely in touch but then um, my involvement uh, at the University of North Texas I wrote music and directed the, uh, the group that went to PASIC every year and so we we kind of stayed in touch through the convention every year and, but as I got into drum corps um, Eric was starting innovative percussion and, uh, you know, I, I already had a, a relationship with him. I already knew him. We were friends. And uh, the keyboard mallets were so much better. And they were just such a higher quality that it was obvious that I wanted to use those, you know? You know, the first stick was, um, since, since virtually all of my experience early on was dealing with indoor percussion, at the time the Percussive Arts Society, the PASIC convention, preceded WGI and it was kind of like the the first model that WGI went off of. The indoor percussion thing was um, it had a couple of practical things about it that you needed to consider and and uh, I wanted a stick that you could use in both environments. I wanted a stick that that you could play inside and outside. And so I think the trend at the time was that indoor sticks were smaller and lighter. And to me, in my thinking, that was the opposite of what it should be. Because inside, the smaller, lighter, higher frequencies were piercing and they would kind of take over. And I thought one thing that you, you sort of needed was kind of a warmer sound. It's kind of a, a little bit smaller outdoor stick, but bigger for an indoor stick. And so that was kind of the, the, the premise or the thought behind it was it needed to be like a warm sounding inside stick. And it turned out to be, it turns out to be like a really uh, good option for, for good younger players. You know, it has a tiny bit smaller diameter, but not, not anything that feels weird. It, it's, it's, it's just, just enough so that it, if, uh, if like a, uh, a younger player can't handle like the biggest marching stick, it's like a, a, a smart thing, you know, to do that. Then I started teaching drum corps outside with Phantom Regiment and it was really loud. <laughs> and I, I, I still credit like the first time I had to learn how to write loud was there. It was because uh, preceding that, none of the cores that I had taught with were extremely over-the-top loud horn lines. It was always a, a very cautionary thing where you didn't want the percussion to be too loud compared to the horn line. But that was the first experience where it was like, I can't hear the drums, you know? <laughs> I got it, we were like full throttle, you know, completely playing out. And so I thought the PR2s, I thought it was, a, a, it was kind of a logical progression for me because it's a little, a little more weight in the bead it's got an you know like an interesting looking bead and an interesting shape to it, and it's the the barrel bullet 
that added a little weight to the front of the stick and then the diameter is the tiniest bit bigger so it was a weightier tool you know and then it got a warmer darker um smoother sound out of the snare drums it was like really noticeable to me it was sounded great you know so that when you had to play full out you didn't you didn't become piercing it didn't become like uh, distorted or it still kept its warm sort of like solid sound um, up to the um, up to the highest dynamic levels you know it kind of it kind of the intention was it was to feel like a what I would consider like a standard really great feeling drum set stick on marching drum that's exactly because that's where my experience was and I just wanted it to feel like that you know if you've got a great stick it kind of makes you want to play more, right? Doesn't it? And, and it makes you want to play better. And it just makes you, it just feels great to play. And it sounds great when you when you play it and it just makes you want to do it more, you know? If you have that kind of a quality um, tool in your bag, it's just, it's fun to play. It's fun to use it. You end up using it more and it ends up being a lot more fun. And then after that, um, the quad stick was, uh, you know, it was another thing where it was kind of like, honestly, I wasn't going to approach innovative with with the desire to come out with a stick unless I had like a real real need for one. In other words, in a, I, I wanted to have an idea and I wasn't just like, oh yeah, let's come out with a quad stick and let's, you know, and that not have any idea what it, I wanted it to sound like so yeah I really thought about it for a while and it was like you know what this I think there's something missing I think I used to really like and I know that the players really liked playing with mallets it just I don't know you talk to any quad drummer um, you know uh, back in the past and it was just like playing with mallets quad mallets like those there was all sorts of varieties of heads and, and you know it's just it just feels a little better on quads and so playing with snare drum sticks on quads was a t was a real uh, change that I feel like people had to accommodate. You know, I think deep down they kind of didn't like playing with snare sticks on quads, and I knew that. And I, you know, but you kind of did it because you know there's certain things about it that that uh, cut more. You know, it, it just is a little more audible sometimes. And but you know, all the other stuff is a little less audible. And so I thought, you know, I wanted a stick that felt like a mallet. You know, I really did. I thought, can't we just make a, a stick that feels more like a mallet? And uh, so then that kind of like, I literally drew the bead on a piece of napkin and gave it to Chris. And I said, what if we did something like this? You know, so it had like a little bit of a, like a, a profile that was kind of mallet-like so that it would feel like a mallet. It had that front sort of feeling to it. And then um, the the handle situation, which when, when you play with aluminum mallets, it had handles, and it was very very convenient to write for flipping the sticks and playing with handles. So I figured, like, can we build that into a stick? And uh, you know, we spent a lot of time just kind of like carving out a space and finding the finding the right hardness of rubber and. Um, going through many versions of it, and then I feel like now, those I, I end up playing with those sticks more than probably anything else. Is I always even when I teach and just play, you know, I I just I've always found working with innovative percussion to be extremely easy, and it was always um, you could always tell there was some for you know some some foresight there, and there was some forward thinking about you know, where we wanted to go and what we wanted to do and where we were, what was next. Every time I visit or every time I come around or every time I, I talk to anybody, it's always like um, the news of what's next, what's coming next, what, what are we doing now? Things are moving forward, things are happening. I just came to the, um, the factory yesterday and the hustle and bustle and things are happening and, you know, and uh, I think that I like to be in that environment. I like to surround myself with those kind of people where, where it's always forward thinking and always always um, progressing, making the next thing better than the last thing and uh, always improving and never catching yourself standing still. 
you know, treading water, but always just moving forward. To see to see it grow from right wrapping mallets in the living room to what it is today is it's fascinating. It's remarkable. I mean, it's just so um, it's such an accomplishment that I think that that it's just I feel lucky and I feel happy to be part of it.